Baptist history. Since I was in the seminary teaching this 50 years ago or more, yeah, well, more than 50 years ago. I'm, a, I'm old. I haven't taught Baptist history in this great in depth because we never had time at Valley Baptist Church to do that. They gave me 16 uh, classes, 16 weeks to do this. And one time I did it in 26 weeks and they liked to croak. They couldn't hardly stand that, you know. But people paid to take my classes there. I didn't get any money out of it, but they paid the church to take my classes because they were um, highly uh, sought after. Uh, Greek and Hebrew and the church history classes, the other classes I did, they they would pay fifteen or twenty dollars, and they wanted to they wanted to get fifteen or twenty dollars every sixteen weeks. And so when I did the one twenty twenty six classes, they wanted to, to make them pay another twenty dollars. And I was giving them uh, handouts and things, but actually I wasn't. I was doing that on, on my own. I was paying for that, so I was losing in every way, <laughs> as usual. No payment for my gas mileage or anything else. But I enjoyed it. I, that was the best classes that I'd done until now. This is class number 64. It's 63 there, but this is number 64. Now <clears throat> we're in. John T. Christians, Volume 2, A History of the Baptist, and we're on page uh, 250. I've gone back and forth a little bit because the book really isn't chronological. Uh, it'll go in back in the 1600s up to 1700s, then it'll go 1800s and come back, covering different little subjects in here. And so I have uh, run back and forth also in this. Now, we're talking about periods of time in the American Revolution, before the American Revolution, etc., etc., etc. And in one of these classes, I've got a pistol that supposedly was Audie Murphy's pistol that was in the American Revolution in 1776. It was British officer's pistol. Evidently, they killed him or took the pistol away from him. It was also in the War of 1812. And he goes back there, and that'll show you, I can show you one of the pistols that were fighting at that time, which were very primitive. It's a flintlock. Very large caliber, maybe 50 yards, you could hit somebody with it, or 25 or 50 yards or something like that. But they, this is the weapons that they had to fight with. Now, <clears throat> this here we're talking about is in 1789, and uh, there was an amendment to the Constitution. The Baptists did not want to ratify the Constitution because it gave you no religious freedom. Some of the New England states wanted, they didn't think they could exist without a state church. They had to have a state church. If people had to be forced to go to church. They, they didn't have freedom of religion. They had to be forced to go to church. That's what they thought. And I'm going to read that in this also. One of the first things Madison proposed on entering the Congress on June the 8th, 1789, was the following amendment to the Constitution of the United States. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now we know that Abraham Lincoln totally set aside the First Amendment and absolutely forbid it when he was president. He was probably one of the worst presidents America ever had, excepting the th present sit tents. He was a uh, cause of the death of over 750,000 people and the destruction of property unbelievable. Now let's go on here. The Baptists felt secure under the new provision of the Constitution. Long afterwards, in March the 2nd, 1819, Madison wrote to Robert Walsh from Montpelier as uh, follows. Pay close attention to this. This went on after the American Revolution, after the First Amendment. Okay? Not every state, states were free to act as they wished. 
It was the universal opinion of the century preceding the last civil government could not stand without the prop of a religious establishment. They didn't think government could stand without the prop. In other words, the government propping up a religious establishment. They had to make people go to church to behave. And that the Christian religion itself would perish if not supported by legal provisions for its clergy. The experience of Virginia conspicuously corroborates the disproof of both opinions. The civil government, though bereft of everything like an uh, associated hierarchy, possesses the requests stability and per performs its functions with complete success, while the number of the industry and the morality of the priesthood and the devotion of the people have been manifestly increased by the total separation of the church from the state. The forces which work for liberty thus been summed up by Bacon in the establishment of the American principle of the non-interference of the state with religion and the equality of all religious communions before the law. Much was due, no doubt, to the mutual jealousies of the sects, no one of the two which were strong enough to maintain exceptional pretensions over the rest combined, except the Baptist. They were the only ones that really believed in true freedom of religion and freedom of choice. Much is also to be imputed in the differentiation and sometimes the anti-religious sentiment of an important, numerous class of doctrinary politicians of which Jefferson may be taken as a type. He was a deist, remember. So far, as this work was the work of an intelligent conviction, the religious faith, the chief honor of it must be given to the Baptist. The Baptist gave you freedom of religion in America. You wouldn't have it otherwise. And they didn't have it instantly either. Baptists were still persecuted in some states. Other sects, notably the Presbyterians, had been energetic and efficient in demanding their own liberties, but not those of others. The Friends and the Baptists agreed in demanding liberty of conscience and worship, equality before the law of all religious groups. The Friends there are the Quakers. Remember, they took Baptists, they arrested them, they would cut their ears off, they would cut the Quakers' ears off, they'd cut their nose off, they would pierce their tongues with a hot rod in a, a forge, they'd heat up and forge and pull their tongues out with, with another hot tong tongs and then pour, poke holes in them so they couldn't preach as easy. Remember, they did that to the Old Testament prophets too. For all alike. But the active labor in this cause was mainly done by the Baptist. It is their consistency and constancy in that warfare against the privileges of the, of the powerful standing order of New England and of all the moribund establishments in the South that we are chiefly indebted for the final triumph in this country and that the principle and the separation of church and state which is the one of the largest contributions of the new world to the whole civilization of mankind. Ruffini also summed this up. He's another historian. By this, the United States solemnly promised that they would never elevate any one form of belief in the rank of a official religion of the Confederation, but that, on the contrary, equal liberty would be conceded to all churches. It was therefore the most absolute separation of the two powers of the United States at the moment of the constituting themselves into a republic placed at the basis of their relations with the churches. And that the separation entrusted the guarantee of the fullest religious liberty. But, strong adversity conjunction, page 15, <laughs> Allah in Greek. There is, however, one thing that must be especially noted. The Constitution of the United States did not abolish the union between the state and church within those particular states in which the separation had not already taken place. There still were states that did not, that still was church and state married. 
the only church of St. Mary, but you had to be married by the church and state, and you had to be buried by the church and state. Total control, manipulation of the masses. Now, no separation had been effected, nor was in religion for the whole century of the New England states, for a whole hundred years. One hundred more years. Again, the Constitution did not guarantee full religious liberty except in federal relationships, not state. And did not remove the restrictions in the eternal relations of these single states. Some of them, the states, however, still remained intolerant in spite of and after the federal Constitution. Chapter 3, page... 253 now. Heretofore, as has been seen, the Baptists were much persecuted. At their baptism, they were annoyed. At one occasion, a clergyman of the established church, which is the Church of England, rode into the water and badgered them as they were baptizing people. They baptized people in water, like the Bible says, you know. They had been whipped, they had been branded, branded with a hot iron. They had been banished. Now there was a systematic effect to make it entirely their, their purpose to overthrow them. The first instance of actual imprisonment says, simple, in his history, we believe that ever took place in Virginia was the county of Spotsylvania on the 4th of July, or 4th of June in 1768. John Waller, Lewis Craig, James Child, and were seized by the sheriff and hauled before their magistrates who stood in a meeting house yard, who bound them in a penalty of 1,000 pounds, that's a lot of money people, to appear in a court two days later. At the court they were arraigned as disturbers of the peace. On their trial they were vehemently accused by certain lawyer who said to the court, May it please your worships, these men are great disturbers of the peace. Does this sound like what happened with the Apostle Paul? Mm -hmm. And Peter? Barnabas? They cannot meet a man upon the road, but that they ram text of scripture down his throat. Mm -hmm. They were evangelists. <laughs> Mr. Waller made his own and his brethren's defense ingeniously, that they were somewhat puzzled to know how to dispose of them. They'd like to kill them. They offered to release them if they would promise to preach no more in the county for a year and a day. This they refused. And therefore were sent into the close jail into solitary close confinement. As they moved on from the courthouse to the prison to the streets of Fredericksburg, they sung a hymn, Broad is the road that leads to death, and etc. This had an awful appearance. After four weeks' confinement, Lewis Craig was released from prison and immediately went to Williamsburg to get a release for his companions. He waited on the deputy governor the Honorable John Blair, and stated the case before him and received the following letter directed to the King's Attorney in Spotsylvania. The King's Attorney in Spotsylvania. I want you to understand this also. The Catholic Church did not want America to become a republic. They said that no people could rule themselves. They didn't have the gift of God to do it. That or that sovereigns and kings were ordained of God and that America was on the wrong path. And no matter what happened, and they, and of course they, they charged all of their Catholics in Germany and in Spain and Italy and uh, Ireland, they forced them to go and fight against the American people in the American Revolution. And then they went so far as to force the Irish people in this country to fight against the rebellion, as they said. Sir, I lately received a letter signed by a good number of worthy gentlemen who are not here, complaining of the Baptists and the particulars of the misbehavior are not told any further than the running into private houses and making dissensions. Mr. Craig and Mr. Benjamin Waller 
are now with me and deny the charge, and tell me that they are willing to take the oaths as the others did, I told them that I consulted the Attorney General, who is an opinion that the General Court <coughs> only have the right to grant licenses. They had to get a license to preach. They had to get a license to get married. They had to get a license to get buried. Because it was church state. This church state began in 325 A.D. with Constantine when he married the church to the state. And it evolved. Catholicism evolved from that period of time onward. It got worse and worse and worse and worse. And finally we had the, uh, the revolution within religion. And they descended and we started the Calvinism. We started the, the Lutheran Church. And of course the Baptists were there all the time. And then we had Methodists coming out of the Church of England and etc., 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 etc. I write to grant license, therefore I referred them to the court. But on the applications to the Attorney General, they brought me his letter advising me to write to you that their petition was a matter of right and they may not be molested in these conscientious people as long as they behave themselves in a matter becoming of pious Christians and are obedience to the law, to the court, they have uh, intended to apply for a license and when the gentlemen who complained may make their objections and be heard. The Act of Toleration, actually the Act of Toleration was written much earlier, has been given them a right to apply in a proper manner for a license in houses and worship of God according to the consciences and I persuade myself that the gentlemen will quietly overlook their meetings till the court. I am told that they administer the sacrament of the Lord's Supper near the matter we do and defer from our church in nothing but in the fact of baptism and in their renewing of the ancient discipline but we have they have reformed some sinners and brought them to true penitence and repentance. Nay, he says, if a man of theirs is idle and neglects to labor and provide for his family, or ought he incurs their censorship, which have good effort effects, it says. And if this be their behavior, it were if it were wished we had more of these among us. But at least, I hope that all may remain quiet till the court. In other words, they can't preach until they go to court. I am with your great respect to the gentleman, <clears throat> your humble servant, John Blair. <clears throat> when the letter came to the attorney, he would have nothing to say on the affair. Walter and the others continued in jail for 43 days in filth and hunger, preaching through the bars, like the Apostle Paul, like Peter, Barnabas, Philip. They constantly preached through the gates. The mobs, without using every exertion to prevent the people from hearing, they tried to make noise out there and interfere with them hearing what they had to say. That's an American now, people. But to little purpose, many heard indeed upon whom the word was in power and demonstration. After their discharge, which was a kind of triumph, Walter Craig and their compeers in the ministry resumed their labors with redoubled vigor, gathering fortitude from the late sufferings, thanking God that they were accounted worthy to suffer for Christ and the gospel. Day and night, indeed, Almost every day and night they held meetings in their own and adjacent neighborhoods. The spread of the gospel and the Baptist principles was equal to all the exertions insomuch that in a few sections of Virginia did the Baptist cause appear more formidable to its enemies and more consoling to its friends than in Spotsylvania. And may we add this, so it is to this day. The outcome of this affair seemed to have further enraged the members of the establishment, the Church of England and the Presbyterians and the Catholics. 
They everywhere attempted to strengthen their cause. A petition was presented by them to the House of Burgess on May the 5th, 1769. A petition was presented from the minister and the sundry inhabitants of the parish of Hamilton, praying for division of the parish into two, for the reason being that the parish was so large that many of the inhabitants resided far from the parish churches, and they can but seldom attend public worship, from which cause the dissenters have opportunity and encouragement to propagate their pernicious doctrines. Talking about Baptists, their pernicious doctrines. Baptism by immersion. Baptism after you, not to be saved. Can you be saved without baptism? Yes. <clears throat> The persecutors were extremely active. William Weber, John Waller, James Greenwood, Robert Ware were thrown into a filthy jail which swarmed with fleas. Untold indignities were placed upon them. On September the 10th, they were allowed prison bond bonds. In other words, they had a bound by which they were much relieved, yet they were frequently under the necessity of re resorting to the jail to avoid the rage of persecutors. They let them out of jail, but they had to run to jail for pr protective keeping, to protection. Mm -hmm. The Lord daily opened the hearts of the people, and the rich uh, uh, sent many presents, things calculated to nourish them in their sufferings and to alleviate their sorrows. William Weber fell sick. This excited the sympathy of their friends in a higher degree. They paid him great attention. The persecutors found that imprisonment and the preachers tend to rather to furtherance of the gospel. If they imprisoned them, the gospel spread faster. They preached regularly in prison. Crowds attended. The preaching seemed to have double weight when coming from a jail cell through the bars. Many viewed it with superstitious reverence so that their enemies became desirous to get rid of them. Accordingly, on the 26th day of September, after having been in jail for 30 days in close confinement, and 16 days in, in bounds, they were liberated upon giving up on for good behavior. The rage of persecutors had in no wise abated. They seemed sometimes to strive to treat the Baptists and their worship with as much rudeness and indecency as they could perform. They often insulted the preachers in the time of service and would ride into the water and make sport of them And there, when they administered baptism, and they frequently fabricated and spread most groundless reports which were injurious to the character of the Baptist. When any Baptist fell into improper contact, it was always exaggerated to the utmost extent. On one occasion, when Robert Ware was preaching there, came on one Davis and one Kemp, two sons of Belial, and stood before him with a bottle and drank, offering the bottle to him and cursing him. As soon as he was closed his service, they threw out a pack of cards and began to play on the stage on the podium where he was standing, wishing them to reprove them that they might beat him. Another, Robert Fristo says, the enemy not content with ridicule and defamation manifested their adhorrence to the Baptists in another way. By law then in force in Virginia, all were under obligation to go to church several times in the year. Forced religion. The failure subjected them to fine and, little, and a little notice was taken of the admission if members of the established church but soon as the new lights were absent, they were preached, by the, they were uh, presented to the grand jury and fined accordingly to the law. They were going to their own church, and now they're going to be fined. Soon they began to take other steps to deter the Baptist preachers, obstruct the progress of the gospel by objecting to their preaching until they obtained the license from the general court whose place of setting at that time was Old Williamsburg. Until such times the license was attained, they were exposed to be apprehended and imprisoned. 
when the persecutors found that religion could not be stopped in its progress with ridicule and defamation and abusive language, the resolution was to take different steps and see that it would do. And the preachers in different places were apprehended by magisterial uh, authority, and some of them were imprisoned and some escaped. Before this step was taken, the, the, per, the parson of the parish was consulted in some instances at least, and that his judgment confided him. His counsel was that the new lights ought to be taken in prison as necessary for the peace and harmony of the old church, the old church. As formerly, the high priest took the lead in persecuting the followers of Christ, remember? In like manner, the high priest had conducted in, in later days, and seldom there was a persecution, but that of the high priest had been at the head of it. The leaders of the Church of England and the other established churches. The results of the persecution were inevitable. Religious tyranny produced its accustomed effects. The Baptists increased on every side, in spite of them. If one preacher was in prison, two arose to take his place. If one congregation was dispersed, a larger assembly on the next day of, of opportunity. Twenty years after the revolution, few of the sect could have been found in the colony, and yet in 1774 their shepherds alone had 30 churches south of the James River and 25 in its north, and the regulars, though not so numerous, had grown with rapidity. The influence of the denomination was so strong among the common people that it was beginning to be felt in higher places. Common sense. Baptists preach with common sense. Simple as that. Baptism is immersion. Baptized, you're baptized because you have been saved, because of your repented. Baptism before you're a believer does you no good. It's no baptism. This is what they taught. First, in their love of freedom. No class of people of the America were more devoted advocates of the principles of the revolution and none more willing to give their money and goods to the country and none more prompt to march into the battlefield and none more heroic in actual combat than the Baptists of Virginia. Secondly, in their hatred of the church establishment. They hated the church of England. They had a right to. They hated not its ministers, but its principles. They had seen its operation and felt its practical influence. Common sense pointed out its deformities and glamoured against it inju its injustices. To a man they were united and resolved never to relax their efforts until it was utterly destroyed. These harsh measures brought many petitions to the House of Burgess for relief. Such petitions, petitions did not bring liberty to the Baptists. The state of affairs is well pictured by James Madison in his letter to his friend Bradford in Philadelphia on January the 24th, 1774, where he says, I, am very, I very believe that the frequent assaults that have been made upon the American Boston, Boston especially will in the end prove a real advantage. If the Church of England had been the, uh, been the established and general religion in all northern colonies as it had been among us an uninterrupted harmony and prevailed throughout the continent, it is clear to me that slavery and subjection might and would have been gradually insinuated among us. Union and religious sentiments begets a surprising confidence. The ecclesiastical establishments tend to, to a great ignorance and corruption, all of which facilities the execution of mischievous projects. I want again to breathe your free air. I expect that it will mend my contribution and my confirm my principles. I have indeed as good an atmosphere at home as the climate will allow but have nothing to brag of to the state and liberty of my country. Property and luxury prevail among all sorts, pride, ignorance, and knavery among the priesthood. 
and vice and wickedness among the laity. This is a bad enough, but it is not the worst that I have to tell you. That the diabolical hell conceived principle of persecution rages among some, and their eternal infamy and clergy can furnish their quota of imps for such purposes. There are at this time in adjacent county not less than five or six well-meaning men in close, in close jail for publishing their religious sentiments, which in the main are very orthodox. I have neither patience to bear or to hear talk or anything of any relative to this matter, for I have squabbled and scowled and scolded and abused and ridiculed as long about it to the little purpose, and I am without common patience. So I must beg you to pity me and pray for the liberty of the conscience of all men. I know this is a lot of reading here, but this is church history. This is what your people, this is how why you have a Baptist church in America today. Our assembly, Bradford says in 1774, our assembly to meet the 1st of May when it is expected that something will be done on behalf of the dissenters. Petitions are here are already forming among the persecuted Baptists, and I fancy that it is in the thought of the Presbyterians also to intercede for greater liberty in matters of their religion. For on my part, I cannot help being very doubtful of their succeeding in attempt. The affair was on the carpet during the last session, but such incredible and extravagant stories were told in the house of monstrous effects of enthusiasm prevailing among the sectaries, and so greedily swallowed by the enemies, that I believe they lost footing by it. And the bad name they still have with those who pretend to such a contempt and examine in their principles and conduct and are too much devoted to ecclesiastical establishments to hear the toleration of the dissenters. I am apprehensive and will be made again pretext for rejecting their request. The sentiments of our people, of the fortune and fashion of this subject are vastly different from what you have been used to. That liberal, Catholic, equitable way of thinking as to the rights and conscience, which is one of the characteristics of a free people, and so strongly marks the people of your province, a little known among the zealous adherents of our hierarchy. We have, it is true, some persons in the legislature of generous principles, both in religion and politics, but number not merit, you know, it is necessary to carry points there. Besides, the clergy are more numerous and more are a powerful body and have great influence at the home by reason of their connection with and depends upon the bishops and the, and the crown and will naturally employ all of their arts and interests to depress their rising adversaries. For such, they must consider dissenters who rob them of their good will to the people and in time endanger their livings and security. In the meantime, all of this tremendous struggle to secure the passage of the law of toleration, religious toleration. The movement of the favor of this law was begun in 1769. The Baptists irritated it by by ill treatment, complained that, that the assembly awakened to the fact that it would be advisable to confirm the Toleration Act in 1699. The attempt to prevent the spread of the dissent, which fell so heavily upon the Baptists from the year of 1768. <clears throat> you understand now why the American Revolution began? I was just going to say that. Yeah. They were ready to fight. Uh -huh. Remember, the one called for a basin, a punch bowl to be brought. He said, bleed yourself in this punch bowl till it's full and dip your swords in that and don't put them, sheath them until we have liberty, religious liberty right. in this land.
It said it would be a firm, uh, advisable to confirm the Toleration Act of, 17, of 1699. The attempt to prevent the spread of the dissent, which fell so heavily upon the Baptists of the year 1768 onwards, convinced the more thoughtful Episcopalians that some, to some degree of restricted toleration must be granted to the citizens of Virginia, or society must be shaken to its foundation. To appease the agitated community, a bill was proposed granted privileges to the dissenters, dissenters to the Church of England and to the Catholic Church. They were the Baptists. And of course, the what they called the Friends, the Quakers. The House of Burgess ordered May 11, 1769, it would be an instruction to the Committee for, for Religion that they prepare uh, a bill for exempting His Majesty's Protestant dissenters from the penalties of certain laws. But the bill was not introduced. It wasn't introduced. Made sure it wasn't introduced. For the second time, it was ordered on November the 10th, 1769. But again, it was not presented. The petition began to come from all various kinds of Baptist churches. A petition of several persons of the county of Lewenburg, whose names are thereunto subscribed, was a, presented to the house and read, setting forth the petitions being the Society of Christians called Baptist, find themselves restricted in the exercise of religion and their teachers in prison under various pretenses and the benefits of the Toleration Act denied them, and all they are willing to conform to the spirit of the Act, they are a loyal and obedient subjects. They wanted to live in a country and just be free to preach. They went from country to country, remember, mm -hmm. for hundreds of years, trying to preach the gospel. Praying that they may be treated with the same kind indulgences and religious matters as Quakers and Presbyterians and other Protestant dissenters enjoy. February the 2nd, 1772, the Baptists of the county of Mecklenburg presented the same petition. March the 14th, the Carolina Baptist presented their petition. There was likewise a petition of several persons of the county of Amelia, whose names are hereunto subscribed, setting forth that the petitioners being the, the community of Christians who worship God under the denomination of Baptist are restricted in their religious exercises, and that the act of toleration does not extend to this colony, and they are exposed to severe persecution. And if it does not extend, therefore, for the power of the granted licenses to teachers being lodged, it's supposed that the general court alone and the petitioners must suffer considerable inconveniences, and not only because the court sets not oftener than twice in the year, and then at a place so far away, but because of this, the court will admit a single meeting house and no one in in one county, and that the petitioners are royal and quiet subjects whose tenants in no wise affect the state and therefore praying for redress of their grievances and the liberty of conscience may be secured to them. These petitions were referred to a committee which reported back in February 25th, insofar as they relate to allowing the petitioners the same toleration in matters of religion as it enjoyed by His Majesty's dissenting Protestants, subject of Great Britain, and under different acts of Parliament, is reasonable. It was ordered that the Committee on Religion do inquire into the state of the established religion into this colony and report the same as it shall appear to them to the House. An amended bill on the subject of toleration was presented to the House and, in, and engrossed March the 17th, and this bill was not satisfactory to the Baptists. It was not satisfactory to the Baptists. They did not want to let them preach. A lie can get a thousand miles before the, before, the boots can, before the truth can get its boots on. That's it. A lie can get a thousand miles before the truth can get its boots on. And that's, they didn't want the Baptists to preach. 
The bill was not satisfactory to the Baptists. On May the 12th, 1774, they protested, not admitting public worship except in the daytime and inconsistent with the laws of England as well as the practice of using of primitive churches and even the English church itself. No baptism by immersion. That the night season may be sometimes better spared by the petitioners from the necessity of duty of their callings, and that they wish no indulgences which may disturb the peace to the government, therefore praying that the house to take their case in consideration and grant them suitable redress. The bill did not become a law. Do you understand why we had the American Revolution? Yeah. A revolution was on, and now the Baptists boldly and effectively attacked the establishment itself and won the victory for liberty of conscience. What a story, isn't it? Yeah. That story gave you religious liberty. But that story tells you how hard it was for you to preach today. Yeah. It is, we are censored today by mass media, even to this day. It's coming back. The persecution is coming back. The conservatives of America have been denounced as radicals, as white supremacists. I'm not white hardly at all. <laughs> I'm probably not more than three thirty seconds white at all, at the most. But they call me a white supremacist because I believe in conservative views. I preach conservative views in the Bible. The Bible makes such dramatic lines between good and evil. Very plain. Many of the things that are practiced in the world today are contrary to the Word of God. And when they are, I just speak out and say what God, this is what God says. But it is not tolerable. It is not palatable to the world today. Our Father, we send this message out that people might learn what it took to have religious liberty that's so slipping slippery, slipping, slipping, slipping through our fingers today. Father, use your word. Use this as you told us to go out and, and preach. Make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to guard with their lives all things that have been commanded unto us. And your son said, I'll be with you to the end of this age. We pray for that. Father, please help us to continue to carry on your word. In Jesus' name I pray.